10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. everyone and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska. Native news and information, last week we promised you part two of the fishing news from Southeast Alaska and today we travel to Cake, Alaska. The Clinkets in Cake, Alaska have a long tradition of living off the sea from subsistence to now commercial fishing. They've had to adapt to change and nowadays with farmed fish they're having to adapt even more. Let's take a look at Cake Alaska and see how they're adapting to this change. Twenty years later, they rebuilt their village here on the northwest corner of Kupernov Island. This was not the first time the cake survived an assault from the outside, and it wouldn't be the last. For centuries, the cakes had a reputation for strength, tenacity, and leadership. They quickly adapted to a changing world. Cake was the first native Alaskan village to earn U.S. citizenship for its residents. Traditional fishermen from the village began selling their fish, adapting to a new cash economy. The cannery here opened in 1912. Around the same time, canneries were opening all over southeast Alaska. Like most seafood, the quality of salmon begins to decrease quickly once it's caught. Canning was the most efficient way to preserve the fish for the trip to far away markets. As the years went by, villages became more and more dependent on the canning business. From processors to boat owners to deckhands, everyone was working hard and making good money. Consumers understood the work involved and were willing to pay a premium for salmon. But then, someone thought of a cheaper way to make salmon. Salmon farms today are well run. Fish are kept in their pens and raised and taken to market. That's our business. This is Vivian Kraus. She was one of many people in the salmon industry that traveled to Juneau recently for Salmon for Success. The Central Council of Clinkett and Haida Indians of Alaska held a meeting to find ways to save the families and villages that depend on salmon fishing. Vivian works in the salmon farming industry. 
the industry these fishermen blame for the low price of salmon on the world market. Dwayne Wilson, a fisherman from Haines, explains. When you, you flood a market full of fish that don't cost much, uh, it makes it, it takes away from the, the fish that, that would uh, be actually be better for you. Keeping his sense of humor even in hard times, Jones Hotch Jr. explains the situation this way. Someone said if you won a million dollar lottery, that he'd commercial fish until he was broke. <laughs> and that's almost how it is now. I want you to know I'm not here because I'm the one that drew the short stick. I'm actually here because um, many people uh, like me in our company uh, understand that um, you have concerns here in Alaska about salmon farming. And so part of what I'm here today to do is um, to share with you kind of how we farm, who we are, um, what we do, and um, perhaps also to answer some of your questions. Vivian's presentation was closely watched, and there were a lot of questions afterwards. How does fish farming benefit commercial fishermen? While there is no question that the flood of farm-raised salmon is the major reason for plummeting salmon prices, there are plenty of questions about the environmental impacts of salmon farms. The basic idea behind salmon farming is to hang huge nets in the ocean and raise fish in them. Vivian showed slides of her company's fish farms on the coast of British Columbia, just south of Alaska. Most salmon farms in British Columbia raise Atlantic salmon because they grow faster and resist disease. But they are also more aggressive, and if they escape, they could kill off wild runs of salmon by taking over their spawning grounds. Now in Canada there's an interesting legal situation in that uh, under the Constitution, um, Aboriginal rights are protected. Eamon Murphy is also from British Columbia. He's an attorney that works with native groups there. Uh, there have been thousands upon thousands of Atlantic salmon that have escaped over the past dozen years or so into BC waters and they've actually discovered now that they've um, the Atlantic salmon have managed to uh, spawn and, and uh, become residents in BC streams. Actually, over a million Atlantic salmon have already escaped from farms in British Columbia, and hundreds have been caught in Alaska. Jones Hotch is worried about what could happen if they interbreed with the wild stocks that coastal villages have depended on for centuries. For the first time, we had a subsistence fisherman from the village catch salmon with great abnormalities if I'm saying that word right, you know. In regards to the shape and the color of the salmon, they haven't caught salmon like that before, and this is raising a great concern to our people. And we're wondering if that will affect not only our Eden, but also the bald eagle and the brown bear and the bears in our area, you know, our wild animals in that area. Bringing in, bringing in uh, infections uh, into the waters um, that's being shared with, uh, with our natural stock. Um, you know, it, it, all it takes is uh, one, uh, one fish to actually cause a, a catastrophe in, uh, Gosh, that, uh, I sure don't want to see that happen with our natural stock. Well, we understand that Alaskans expect us to keep our salmon in our pens, and that's exactly what we're doing. We're working very hard in terms of rebuilding farms, and most importantly, training people so that salmon farms today are well run. And now we have trained aquaculture technicians working on all of our farms in a kind of a multidisciplinary team involving biologists and of course a veterinarian that specializes in fish health. And um, we're able to do things properly. I think done properly, salmon farming is not a bad thing for the environment. A few years ago, environmental concerns caused British Columbia to prohibit new fish farms from operating. Recently, however, that moratorium was lifted.
The market is demanding newer and greater products, more of the fresh or the frozen fillets and other kinds of products that are more usable to the housewife across America and the world. Most consumers rank quality as the most important factor in selecting salmon. Currently, salmon does not have to be labeled farmed or wild. This is where you can help. Robert Losher is an assemblyman for the Central Council of Clinket and Haida. But all of us here in this room and those in our communities should be sending telegrams to Governor Murkowski and to our legislature to say, we want you to invest in Alaska's marketing of fish. The Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute markets Alaska's seafood worldwide and is funded by the state. Um, we are also asking for state general funds for salmon marketing uh, to the tune of about five million dollars. This is not something that is unusual. The salmon or the, uh, the, the legislature right now is appropriating money um, general fund dollars to promote the tourism industry. Um, we appropriate general fund dollars to promote the, uh, the opening of Anwar so we can produce oil out of Anwar. Um, we have not, however, provided general fund dollars for the promotion of Alaska salmon and Alaska seafood since I think about 1997. What the fishermen here dream of is a consumer that wants quality and asks for wild Alaska salmon. That's why a law requiring farm-raised salmon to be labeled as such would help a lot. That's also why the people in Cake are changing the way they do business. We've, uh, we've targeted the uh, high value, uh, good flesh quality seafood and uh, you know we've uh, taken some steps to alleviate the problems that we've had with the poor flesh quality in uh, composting some of that stuff. Uh, value adding the seafood that uh, does come into the plant either through smoking or through uh, uh, adding some value through fletches or fillets. So we've tried to increase our value every step of the, the process. Sam Jackson is president and CEO of Cake Tribal Corporation. Like many villages in southeast, Cake was rocked by declining salmon prices. Then, true to their spirit, the people here regrouped and started again. We're a seafood people, you know, we're, we're a people from the sea. The Clinket people have always produced uh, from the open ocean. And we've been trying over the past years to, to make the operation pay for itself. Cake Foods opened their doors in 1998, just up the shore from that original cannery. Uh, these are coho. This is Lauren Jackson, Jr. He's a production manager here at Cake Foods. Basically just filleting the fish, obviously, and deboning it. That's what this machine over here does. And then we'll uh, start cutting it and getting it ready for uh, the smokehouse. We're just cutting it into strips and uh, small little square chunks, which we call our strips and our nuggets. After we get it all, all the fish processed and cut into nuggets and strips, then they'll be brined overnight, uh, about 13 to 15 hours. Just salt and brown sugar, you know, to um, what the natives around here use, just salt and brown sugar for their, for their home smoke, so pretty traditional stuff. In the summer, the cake foods plant is really hopping. but the plant also provides employment through the winter. Cake's Dungeness crab line did 8,000 pounds the first year and 400,000 the next. The coho salmon they are working on today was flash frozen last summer. Well, these, these have coils in the top of them, fans. Scott Browning is the factory manager here. He's one of a handful of experienced people Cake Foods handpicked to ensure a quality product. It quick freezes the fish in six to eight hours. It holds the freshness, keeps some, keeps some pressure. And the fish arrive at Cake Foods fresher. The direct benefit of, uh, of, the, of the location of Cake Foods Incorporated is it's right in central southeast Alaska. 
It's uh, two hours from Chatham Strait. It's right outside Frederick Sound. It's right in Kiki Strait where all the fisheries occur. And, uh, you know, if somebody doesn't sell to Cake Foods, they'll be running five hours to Petersburg or 10 hours to Juneau to deliver their product. And we feel that if we capture that uh, species of salmon or, or species of crab or species of halibut or black cod, that we can ma maximize the quality of that product by minimizing the, uh, the run time between uh, the next processor down the road. So we feel we have a competitive advantage by our location. But is it easy to get the product out? Uh, not really, no. You know, there's always a weather factor. For our smoke products, we need to fly it out, and, you know, because especially with our fresh product and our, our frozen product, you know, it has to be shipped out on, on a barge, which, I don't know, it costs too much, you know. But, uh, you know, that's life. Life on the rock, you know. We definitely have some challenges. We have one small commuter airlines that comes into town. Uh, we fly a lot of product out. Uh, we have one uh, shipping line, Alaska Marine Lines, that comes into town. And the ferry system. And what I think the, the state of Alaska needs to do is to look at the transportation infrastructure for the smaller communities in Alaska and try to maximize the, the value that they're producing on their products. In other words, it's better to make smaller shipments that are worth more. That's why Cake Foods got into the roe business. High quality roe, the eggs of the salmon, is worth a lot of money, especially on the Japanese market. But there is a tricky problem. The salmon with the highest quality roe typically have the lowest quality meat, and it's illegal to just dump the carcass after the row is removed. The people in Cake looked around at the land they've used for centuries and found a solution. This is David James. He's peeling the cover back on one of Cake Foods' newest products. Hey, here we have mulch. It's got sawdust from our logging division and mixed with our salmon carcasses from Cake Foods or Cake Fisheries. Took our waste products together and hopefully make something natural and organic. We can hit the natural foods markets, which is what we're aiming for. All right. If you've ever made mulch for your backyard garden, you know it needs to be mixed up from time to time. But with about half a dozen rows of mulch, four foot high and a hundred yards long, they needed something special. Cake Foods invested in this mulching machine. The two-story tall machine straddles the rows and mixes them with special blades that hang down underneath. David is in charge of shipping the mulch. Because it has a long shelf life and doesn't need to be refrigerated, it can be shipped out by barge at a low cost. I just got back, like, you know, not too long ago, so... I need a reminder of what's in here. Back at the plant, Lauren and his crew are just about to put the nuggets and strips into the smoker. Taking the fish out of the brine after we cut it up, and uh, we're wrapping it so we can smoke it. We smoke it for about three to four hours, just smoke, and then we start to cook it. So this will be a hot smoke, fully cooked, ready to eat product. Yeah. And over here is our actual oven. Yeah, it looks complicated, but it's, it's really, really simple. And this is our sawdust hopper, which is uh, primarily alder wood. And we have it set just enough to give it, you know, feed it enough to give the smoke that we want it to taste. This summer, Cake Foods hopes to double the amount of seafood it moves through its plant. That means a lot more work for everybody, including David. I've been started off, was it last year? I was working on the floor, 
worked my way up and I learned how to do shipping, a little bit of sales, a little bit of composting, and everything's, you know. So they make me work for my money, but I like it, it keeps me on my toes. David was born here in Cake. Like Sam and Lauren, he doesn't see the price collapse as the end of the salmon industry. To the people here, it's merely another transition. And if the past is any indication, Cake will no doubt lead the way in the new salmon economy. Thank you everyone for joining us for another Heartbeat Alaska Native News, Native Information. The premier Native News and Information in America. Thank you all for joining us and remember, when you go shopping, choose Wild Alaska Salmon, won't you? It's the best. God bless every one of you. We'll see you again next week. To purchase a copy of this program, ask for a heartbeat number 41103. That's heartbeat number 41103. And send your check or money order for $20 to Jeannie Green Productions, 6216 Old Seward Highway, Anchorage, Alaska, 99518. Or give us a call, 907-563-7440. No, I've been working here since, since I was in high school. It's about 17. I'm 23 now, so. I love it. It's nice, it's quiet. You got a lot of hunting, fishing. You know, I like the nice, quiet life. There's people here, they look out for each other. If something happens to somebody, the whole town pulls together to help out. I've lived in the cities, you know. If you fall on the side of the road, people just step right over you and keep going. Which is why I love living here. Great people. Great people. Over the years, I was getting better and better. We're getting better equipment making more money. We went from, you know, maybe three to four employees during the year to, how many did we have last year? About, about 20, yeah. So, it's getting a lot better. It's improving a lot. I'm proud to say that I work here and put out good products and getting recognition all over the place for it.